Hello everyone and welcome back. Today, as always, I'll be streaming a programming language that's being developed in Rust. The aim of the language is to, well, it's called Seed and it aims to be a research language for playing around with different language constructs and ideas. So for example, playing around with different error handling mechanisms and just a general playground for programming language ideas. So thus the name Seed from which other ideas can grow. And that is something I'm writing in Rust with an aim to having a follow-on language based on it, or at least based on the core code base, which is aiming to be called Ash as an alternative to Bash scripting, which aims to keep the ergonomics of Bash, but give a more shall we say, consistent and maybe familiar syntax for people who develop in a lot of more recent languages, particularly C-style programming languages. And so that's the project so far. We're about 90% of the way into the feature set for Seed. And the language environment that I'm using is, as you can see here, so there's a couple of things going on here. First of all, the environment as a whole is running in a remote server, which I connect to using Mosh. So that keeps a stable connection. Even if the connection drops, it'll be very easy to reestablish it. And it uses Tmux for maintaining and shall we say multiplexing sessions and windows within the one mosh connection and so we can see here i've split my working environment into three tmux panes on the left here we have basically standard vim with a few of my own configurations and the only plugin I really use is nerd tree here on the left. We have just a little shell here at the bottom left for running Git and bits like that. And then on the right hand screen, I use ENTR to rerun the project and tests and linters and things like that whenever any of the either source files change or the tests change. And so with that in mind, the feature that I'm working on at the moment, so I started this yesterday, was what I used to call the unspread operator, but now I'm calling the collect operator, which is for use when you're performing a variable deconstruct. And so particularly with either lists or objects, where if there is this collect operator at the end, it essentially allows for variable amounts of deconstructing. So if we have six elements in a list and we deconstruct to two elements and a collect element, then the first two elements will go into the first two variables and the remainder will go into the third as a list. And similar, this is essentially the when used in the context of a function call, that's essentially a, how to call it, a var args operation or declaration, I suppose. So that's where we are at the moment. I was maybe doing a few too many things at once yesterday in the initial implementation of this. So what I'm going to do today is take a little bit slower, tackle one piece at a time, and hopefully that will make it a little easier to work through because there are a few moving parts to this. And so it I will ideally make it easier if I go at this at a little more collected pace. So let's see, we have collect being used when, when there is an, a list expression. Now, collect will only be 
allowed in the case where the expression is on the left hand side of a of an assignment statement and so errors in terms of collect being used in the wrong context will be caught at the evaluation step in general but i think there is a situation where we want to catch it or where we can catch it at compile time as well so or rather parsing time and that is is that here so when there is an expression list in the case of a function call now are these the only so the only two areas where we can have an expression list is when there is a list of items or a function call. So this would be a list literal. Now one thing we could do is duplicate expression list so I can't remember how to clear spam. Maybe I will just, so I think there's something about settings here. Mm. Can I do clear chat? No, it doesn't seem to have. <laughs> On something there. Okay, I'll have to set up my chat filters again, I think. Okay, <laughs> there we go for the moment. So let's see. We can either, like I say, duplicate expression list, or we can, now that I see this chat item as well, it's actually called Twitch scam you, which doesn't inspire a lot of confidence. I'm not sure who, who the target audience is there. Maybe I can just, can I just send some messages into the chat myself? spending too too much time on that although okay let's let's do that just to clear the chat in a slightly hacky way okay so we're back to where we were so we can either I mean, I'm tempted to do that, just duplicate it. There is a, a mechanism in Lallerpop so that we can keep track of errors. But because this is kind of the first instance of this, and because There's only two usages of this. I'm tempted to just, rather than adding a whole error handling thing, I'm more tempted to just handle it like this. So instead of 
expression list, I'll go add list, which will be functionally equivalent, but won't have the gather operator, which I'm going to rename as collect. Is there another way I could handle this? and we also have param list is the other one that does actually take does allow for a collect operation at the end and there are two instances of that and a param list can be a, is a comma separated list of expressions Expression list is slightly different because it also allows for the spread operator if the thing is a if the expression is an expression to be evaluated rather than the left hand side of an, an assignment. So I want to, instead of it being a kind of separated list of expressions now, I'm going to create a new production item, which will still be an expression, but it will allow for the collect operator now that allows for any of the expressions to 
be collected. Unless I just want to duplicate that as well. this kind of a setup this time as well. Let's we'll see. Let's just save that as is and see what essentially what errors we get back. So anonymous symbols like this cannot be combined with named symbols. So that's okay. Let's give it a name. So named symbols are only allowed at the top level. So I wonder how we can access those guys and see if they're set or not. Are they accessed like tuples? I'm not sure. I also realized yesterday that the CPU was kind of maxing out after running the tests a couple of times and I discovered that some of the the scripts that got run in the background didn't terminate properly so they were I guess doing like infinite loops and that was maxing out the CPU so that could also have been accounting for some of the slow test runs yesterday. So let's see, items collect, yeah, they're all fine. Now, I'm not sure how to access. The different parts of this. And I was expecting an error. Oh, yes. So I found an option of let's see here I when we're doing a push we expect a tuple which is a raw expression u size u size and then we instead get that So 
that was to do that. And then our ads. the inconsistency here so we have args on function definitions and on fu function calls but parameters ideally would be what we use for function definitions and arguments for function calls at least that's the way I think of it anyway existing terminology. place anyway and same here we don't need that and let's see where else so So those issues are in mod. I guess the last issue to find out is this piece where we have 
items collect. At the end. So I guess it's this one. And for some reason I'm saying I need a semicolon there. Is that although that's not the right one because there's no comma there okay I'll try compiling it again Anyway, well, that's been worked on. I can start taking a look at mod potentially. Oh, that's mod for tests. So mod here for val, and we want its statement function for function definition. We have collect args, and we have expression function. We need collect args there as well. And I also have call. Yeah, I removed collect args from that. Hmm, I'm at a bit of a loss as to why it's requiring the semicolon there. doesn't seem to correspond with this in its own way because there isn't this comma but that could just be because of the way it's getting rendered by Lavapop into parser.rs so maybe I'll just ignore that aspect to it could this be the issue? I'd say that was it actually. Cool, so now we have collect args and collect args on function. So how are we gonna handle this? So we have bind name. That's binding the new function. And that's just creating a new function. So that's all we need to do there really. And probably similar here. We just have new func. And it'll just be collect args clone.
Okay, so with this part, we're creating a new binding, which will map all the argument names to the argument values. But now we want to say that if we collect the arguments, then we collect them into the last how do we say we collect them into the last parameter so let's see okay first i'll see what the newest issues are and seven four six I think that's the one I'm working on. Yeah, so let's go ahead and take a look at the actual implementation here. So now we're not gonna be able to really use our convenient zip operation anymore. Instead, we'll probably have to do something else. So let's go ahead and create a vector and we'll go for i in zero to r fouls that length even though just because we've made sure that oh well actually that is now something that needs to change so how will this work so we'll say Do we want to have logic to say if the number of arguments is less than the number needed? Basically, I'm just thinking, can I be clever and not really have to handle collect args too much directly? But what I'll do is I will just handle it basically in lots of if statements to start with and then I can see which of those I can collapse basically. So to start off with we'll now have if num args is not so if collect args if num so that's the case if we're not collecting arguments. Otherwise, if the number of arguments that we got is less than the number that we need, then we go too few args and that would be minimum or something. Then in our bindings, what we would say is for i in zero to our names length, minus 
plus one. say if collect args else in the else condition. And what we're want, going to want to do here is for the remainder left this for the moment actually so I've actually started with the handling for parameter lists even though I wanted to focus on the handling of the collect operator for lists first so whether I stashed this for now now that I think of it mm. well I'll keep going for the moment anyway so for What's my best way of creating a new list here? So I'll have a value. And it's just a vector of valref with source. Okay, let's let's see where that gets us. So first of all I'll comment that out for the moment. Just because I don't have that new error variant defined yet.
Okay, yeah, and that's just a matter of calling it two vec. So that might be all that's needed for the moment anyway. There's probably something smart I can do with the zip. Seems to be life cycle stuff, which should be easy enough to resolve. See where that gets us. All the functions are broken. But that's okay for the moment. What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to leave it there. on just lists for the moment. So that's my best way of splitting this out, splitting this work out for the moment. I guess I'll move it onto a separate branch. So that I'll move, that I won't move, that I will move, that Won't, won't, will, won't, will, will, will. 
not have. Oh, I have to start patching again. Restore staged. So the art list stuff is one thing that I do need to keep around. So skip, skip, skip. Skip, keep. Skip, skip, skip. Keep, skip, and when I say keep, it's keep in the new branch, which is probably not the best way of expressing that. So now we'll keep, so we'll keep that locally. This will be for one of my other branches at the moment. Handle integer too big, add duplicate bind location operators and returns. Okay, wonder if any of those have been merged already. But anyway, work in progress. Funk. Rip. We'll effectively call them vargs. Essentially, stash that and go back. and we're going to say that when it's on the right hand side it's an error so let's go ahead and do that first raw expression list and actually we have the error for that already so and so we'll actually have the implementation here so let's go if we have collect and we would have if the left so if we are collecting Let 
think if there are more items on the in fact what I'll do is I will add some test cases because this is something that like I say I'm going to be very susceptible to like off by one errors here I think so best to be safe so I'll add some runtime errors as well then that's an issue but not if we have sorry three on the left and two on the right so if we print c in that case that'll be that and print c it will go three and then finally we'll collect four to three Not liking the naming the raw naming convention that I'm using here. Usually I use that when there's some kind of conversion happening. This is more collecting and destructing destructuring arguments, so it's not really as as applicable here, I think. Anyway, I'll save those tests and let's see. to do this time instead is like before we're going to go for i in 0 to LHS length minus 1 that should be in rust anyway that's zero up till less than the so it's a an exclusive range iteration but i better double check that so this is 
probably going to use a numerate. Yeah, that's not quite what I'm looking for. Yeah, I could do that kind of an iter. Sometimes though, it gets a little trickier to read with the the zips and stuff like that. I feel like sometimes it's just a little clearer with very bog standard for loops and things. So that's kind of what I'm wanting here, but yeah, we'll have to see. Why is the rest of that list item being ignored? I wonder. Because the list item could be spread, I guess. And realistically, we want to raise an error if is spread is being used there. some piece again. So for collecting, we'll say that the new item is a value new list of LHS. if it's not a collect then we just take the right hand side last index and in theory 
the checks up here should make sure that we're not getting out of bounds errors if we are to be honest i kind of wanted to panic because that's a an issue with the interpreter rather than something that a developer can fix on their own so i want to kind of want it to fail badly in that kind of case well i don't want it to but i think that's the most sensible approach and by this stage, yeah, we want to do our final bind then. this a bit so so if i is equal to lhs then minus one i just want to see what a typical Okay, so I really have to look at the range expression. And it's, yeah, so equals makes it x, equals makes it inclusive. Otherwise, by default, it's x, the end is exclusive. Okay, so that's basically what I want. elements in the right hand side if it's a collection otherwise we just go with well, actually we can combine these if it's the last element and it's collect shadowing these variables but for the moment I'll just do it. <laughs> and 
let's try that. Okay, so we're compiling again. And so, what are the issues that we're getting here? So first of all, we're getting an error when we collect too few and that's expected because we're not handling the error properly first. And so we're also getting cannot bind four items to three variable names. Now that should be okay. So we want to change when we flag that error. So, so what is the magic formula? So if the number on the right hand side is greater than the number on the left minus one, then we're okay. If it's greater than or equal to the number on the left minus one. So basically, if that's the case, then it's okay. So to make it not the case, we can do that and we can also mm, Oh, 
oh i can <laughs> my brain's got a bit blank here i know that there's a simple way of or there might be a way of simplifying this so that it's greater than not plus one but So let's check the, the conditions. So here we have the left hand side is greater than one. So that's an error. Down here we have three is greater than two, that's okay. It's greater than three, that's okay. And it's less than four, that's okay. So what's the, <laughs> this is getting very rudimentary, but for whatever reason, my brain just isn't, isn't simplifying these things today so basically i need to come up with the the boolean formula that makes this that solves this so so a is greater than b plus one so is three greater than two plus one yes is three greater than two plus one no is three greater than three plus one no is three greater than four plus one no so I can invert, I should be able to invert that also. So is two less than one? No, is two less than two? No, is two so let's try putting an equals back in is two less than or equal to one no is two less than or equal to two yes is two less than or equal to three yes so we can either have this or not this i guess Hey Morlex, welcome to the channel. So I think this is the combination we want. And I'll put this up here as well so that we have it being a little bit more legible. No ergs. terminology I would nearly say that that's num params oh nice glad to hear it and so oops so that should at least get our 
tests passing. Now I'll be wanting to update the name of the error variant here, but no, so it's it's done the opposite. So I've so I cannot bind two items to three variable names and so on. So maybe if I flip that. Like if I just keep doing, like the, at least the error tests are handling the boundary conditions well enough that if I hopefully shuffle numbers around enough, I'll get the results that I want. All combining hip boxes for, for video games. Yeah, that's a, uh, or even just collision detection and things like that. I mean, those are, <laughs> that can be very tricky. Anything to do with coordinate geography, geometry and things like that, I think can be a bit messy, but yeah. Oh, for optimization, oh, cool. And, but to me, it's like, like better or worse, you know, it really is all relative. You know, there's, <laughs> I have certain, specializations but then there's a whole lot that i mean even here this is something now just figuring out like boundary conditions and things like that or working around off by one errors usually they're things that i really excel at but whatever for whatever reason today it's just getting the better of me but we've gone down to two errors here at least so I think we're on the right track. So maybe if we add one here. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I agree, Thanos. And welcome to the channel as well. <laughs> so plus one, okay, so let's do, <laughs> yeah. So basically programming by coincidence here. But, you know, even programming by coincidence, if you have enough error cases and conditions checked then it's not not the end of the world either ideally you would be or ideally i would not be <laughs> programming by coincidence i usually love to really dig into the weeds of exactly what and why my code is doing what it's doing but yeah, that seems to, well, that seems to have gotten me where I want to be, but now I've got a panic. Whoops, have I got cap lock, caps locks enabled? Yeah, I did. So yeah, so it's an interpreter and so far, the language that I'm working on is mostly for research purposes. So the core is what I'm building out at the moment. So there isn't too much that I would say is novel in it. I have emphasized consistency in the language though. So there are a number of areas that I think kind of like the way Python 3 made, you know, it didn't necessarily revolutionize Python 2, but I think made things a lot more consistent. I'm kind of designing this language with that in mind as well, but as a whole, it's going to be fairly, you know, non, it's not going to rock the boat too much, but then the idea is to build other languages on top of it and use it as a research base for playing around with those. So for the most part, yeah, it's it's just a, a simple AST language and it's just an interpreted one for the foreseeable future because it's not targeting any performance in particular isn't one of the goals of the language. So it's, yeah, exactly. Oh yeah, good advice uh, there too, Marlix. In fact, I, 
was saying earlier, but I noticed yesterday my CPU load was maxing out for a long time recently. And I realized that it was one of my own tests that had an infinite loop in it, but it kept running in the background. So finally, when I killed it, it, it released the CPU from its grip. But I think, I think that's why I was experiencing a lot of really slow test run times yesterday. So the length is one, but the index is one, and that's happening in bind line 507. So that is where this line. So that is a little surprising. So that's happening on list collect too few. So in list collect too few, what are we expecting here? We're expecting the left hand side to have three items, the right hand side to have one, and the left hand side should have the collect boolean as true. So we should be going into here the number of Oh, I said number of params, but I forgot that we're not dealing with parameter lists here at the moment. So I'll have to actually rename that. I'll just, yeah, call it LHS lane. And so on the Left hand side, we have three. So three minus one is greater than two or is greater than one. So yeah, two is greater than one. So it should actually raise this error. So why isn't the error being raised, I wonder? left hand side yeah so we shouldn't be yeah it's it's correct that a panic should be happening down here but we shouldn't really be getting to this case because we should be getting an error higher up in the flow so we'll see Yeah, so that is, uh, so Thanos, in terms of your question, I kind of agree sometimes. Well, I, I do make a big effort to actually simplify a lot of my Rust code because I think there can be a lot of syntactic noise per line. And especially I, I, Sometimes I see Rust code and it's doing like a lot of things on just a few lines. So I really make an effort to, to split it out. But yeah, there is, a, I guess there is a good deal of abstraction just on top of the core project in a way. So there are, I mean, parts of it are beneficial. So in if I was writing this in something like C or the likes, then you would probably be passing around mutable objects a lot more. In this project, you have to be very explicit about the fact that you have two references to the same variable. So it does add a good bit of overhead in terms of the, shall we say, just even type level abstractions. But it is beneficial because even it, like even already, there have been a few cases where it saved me from making somewhat silly either concurrency or reference updating mistakes that could have been quite insidious again if I was writing this in something like C or the likes. So uh, line 505, what's going on here? Oh yeah, numprams, so that should be LHS then. But yeah, there is a cost at the, where the cost would usually be at runtime in other languages. 
in the form of bugs generally. Here we do have a bit of uh, syntactic and type level overhead with with that with the benefit that we get. Cannot bind one item to three variable names. So yes, that is now in the right direction at least. So the error message isn't correct, but the error is at least being thrown. So let's see, can we make a more descriptive error? So Yeah, and I think don't think I really need to change the error message actually. So I can just update that. Can I bind one item to three variable names? And that should be all the test passing actually. But I also want to add in a new test for a case that it was very bold of me to, <laughs> to skip before but basically the case of struct spread. And so the error here would be Destructure spread. And now it would be nice to be able to highlight the specific, I mean, one, one issue with this is that it won't give the correct position of the element that the spread is on, but it'd be a bit of work. Like I'll add a comment here to specify that but it'll be a good chunk of work to actually fix that here so i'm going to leave it for the moment a keyboard pad well it's also i know to be honest i have not put too much effort into like optimizing my setup and things like that for sound i just do do the very basics so i have like a, a yeti mic here and it's right in front of my keyboard, which is uh, Kinesis 2, which like I use it for the for the ergonomics, but I think it can be quite loud. <laughs> so um, it, it is what it is. Um, maybe I'll play around with putting the, the mic a bit further away, but I'm not sure how much that'll actually help. Although that's a, an interesting point about the thin table. Like it's not a particularly thin table, but at the same time, the mic is resting on top of it. So maybe it's reverberating up along. I'm not sure, <laughs> but yeah, maybe, yeah, as, as time goes on, I might see, can I do 
little bits of improvement to the setup at different times. So list destructuring spread. Cannot use spread operator in list destructuring. And will I include the index that it was found in? Yeah, might as well. malformed form for loop is that something <laughs> is it is that something in the error messages here or is this a a, a tangent a separate discussion i guess it's tangential um i guess one that's maybe syntactically incorrect but i'm not really sure the context is this in yeah again it's in optimization <laughs> i'm not sure to be honest so let's go ahead and save those and i'll add my new test as well so list destruct Here we have cannot use spread operator at index zero of list destructure. Okay. Did I not save the... Oh, yeah. Okay, and that's passing now. That's cool. So that's list, sp uh, not spreading, list collecting implemented and also an extra test added for an error condition. So now let's see if we can clean some of these other bits up. This block can be collapsed oh yeah that makes sense and the last bit is with the lollipop parser I have mute tail somewhere and I don't need it. I mean, I'm doing a push here on the tail, so I feel like I need it, but I guess I'll see what happens if I leave it out. Oh, and I need to update the features file.
Yeah, so, oops. So I'll try opening Blender Pop again, but it's still saying Muse Tail. Oops. So I guess it's that one. I need to maybe put it back there. I'm not sure. Anyway, add that features test and add some more documentation. So list destructuring. Is it an operator though? I, I keep calling it an operator, but really it's a, how would you call it? I feel like an operator is something that occurs between two operands. Whereas that's more an annotation, what do we call it that? So it's in mod, so I need to add an error test for that as well. So runtime errors, let's see. So 
something like that. So list collect outside the structure. This is a list collect outside destruct. Oh, I think it's just a timing issue with when I ran the test. That was the features file. here is the position so it's at character 8 cool so I think I'm basically ready to commit that add support for in this structure. Cool. So I can push that and that's another item off to-do list, so that's lists done. Now, there's also objects and function call parameters, so the second of which I basically started earlier, so maybe I will go ahead and merge that back in. Okay, maybe I'll just cherry pick it so or and it's zero three B five four. see where we are with the parser first of all. So we have the update to parameter list and that's basically it for that. I think ASD has been updated as well so we've got collect args in both function literals and function declarations. And so then it brings us to yeah, so we have that added to when we're defining a function. 
functions have collect args. So we're basically at the point where, in fact, I think the I probably implemented the majority of this, and it's just to to fix the errors in it really at this point. So I think it's happening in not bind actually, but mod. And it's probably in the actual function call. Now this part is quite big, isn't it? But yeah, I think it would be worth moving that into its own function. here for if and when it fails. new location error for the moment. I will just comment those out. Although that won't be great for my tests. So maybe I'll just go ahead and import it properly.
Is that the right type signature? I'm not sure. this case back to the error state, but at least I have some work done on this now today, so it should be more a case of copying over the logic. So let's see, we have arg names, length and arg files. So Instead, go, let's go. Instead of num args, we'll have that and we'll copy the error as well arg num mismatch
Okay, and here we have the similar logic as in binding lists. Except now we're doing, we're defining the bindings and keeping track of them rather than adding them to the context as a side effect. So let's see. Again, we'll do this somewhat special approach where we We'll do everything in the one loop, but we'll handle the last item especially. I don't think I can encounter a spread in the parameter list, so I should be safe enough here. Let me just double check that though. That's the type of the parameters here. It's Arguments are list items. But they've already been evaluated. So where do I, do I just skip it there at the moment? That should really be an error, probably. I'm not sure. I don't remember <laughs> how my mental state was when I was coding that, so I'm not sure how well thought out that piece was. So, Coming back to where we are now, we'll do, we have the arguments at least. I mean, in the context of, yeah, so this is a function. No, oh, have I done this again? No, no, um, yeah, so it is in the context of a function call. Yeah, it's, it's kind of two sides of the, the same operation. So the function call results in the actual evaluation of the binding collection. And so both are actually so in the call itself, you can perform the spread and then in the parameter definition, you can have the unspread. So the call is essentially the right hand side in the context of like assignments. So our call is the right hand side and the parameter list is the list destructure on the left hand side. Okay, so that's actually an interesting way of thinking about it. I mean, it's more or less equivalent to what I was thinking before, but frames it slightly differently. So I have a, an, a more interesting view on it now. So back to where we were, we're going to say if
So let's try that. And what was the error there? 53 minimum. Not found in this scope, so that should be a parameter, I believe. And they're kind of weird errors as well. My testing strategy. <laughs> Thanks very much for the question. Probably a dangerous question because I've put quite a lot of thought into it. But in general, I have two main types of tests for the majority of the project which I split into essentially their standard input, standard output tests, if I were to call them that. So if I look at a test file like this, or maybe a more interesting one would be operations. Essentially, a single test file is broken into blocks of tests, or yeah, test blocks, where each test block for the default types of tests is in two parts. One is the source file, so a new file will be created with that code. Then the interpreter is run on that, and then the second half of the block defines the expected output that would result from running that script. And so you just compare the two and verify that it worked as expected. And that is fine for the majority of tests, which are success tests. But then there are a bunch of tests like parsing error tests or runtime error tests where there's some extra information. So this is actually split into three blocks where there's an additional preamble at the moment. it You can only specify the exit code, but in time there might be other bits of metadata that you can add up here to, to enhance the test. But at the moment, it just makes sure that when this script gets run, the exit code of the interpreter is this, and the standard output is, it. for most of these tests, the standard output is empty, but then the standard error stream will contain this data. And so, I also have a bunch of unit tests and things like that, but the majority of the tests for this project are in the form of these kind of standard input, standard output tests. Yeah, thanks for the question. Hope that answers it. And so there are a couple bits here. Well, first is maybe it's just to do with the error, the new wrapping error not being unwrapped properly in main. I think it's in main that that happens. So if I do that and just unwrap the error message properly, that might see a 
lot of the tests passing again. I wonder if it'll be all the tests passing again. Okay, so that was <laughs> that was actually all the issues. It was just all the error tests were failing because the error rendering was messed up because I hadn't properly handled the new wrapping error. So with that done, so I've been streaming for two hours and 10 minutes. So yeah, I guess what I'll do is I'll just add, I'll try and finish out this feature just with some error tests and featured tests and documentation and anything else? No. Oh, I just need to clean up and make sure that the the line counts aren't too long. a lot of real code um, as in code like real world scripts and things like that so not just testing the base features but yeah yeah exactly a hundred percent and that's the idea anyway at the same time I was doing like I was so this is kind of the second iteration of this project. And in the previous iteration, I was doing a lot of that kind of testing. I wasn't really doing many unit tests, but I was writing a lot of, again, closer to real world scripting. So I was porting scripts from different languages and things like that. And that was good for definitely getting into the weeds and finding maybe some certain edge conditions and things for for testing at the same time because I didn't have the baseline of all the other tests it meant that I don't know it, it's like I, I have a bit of a, a funny relationship with unit tests in general I think that unit tests are well unit tests are very very useful and functional but the majority of the time when we're designing systems it's really most important that the system works end to end and quite often especially when you're dealing with things like databases and web servers the different layers of the of the system aren't too complex in and of themselves. Like you're not really writing too many, for example, sorting methods or very complicated calculations, which in and of themselves are useful to unit tests on their own. So integration tests are quite handy. However, when it is something like a, an interpreter or something where it all the work is being done in memory and it's calculating things in a slightly sophisticated process, having a very good, like, I think the integration tests are real world scripting where you're testing a lot of the different aspects of the interpreter at the same time in a very integrated way is one, is still one of the most important things to test because you need to make sure that the thing is working end to end and not just on on sample code but it is one of those things that is of sufficient complexity that it, to me anyway I'm feeling much more comfortable in the stability of the project 
now that I have all these, I'd say, yeah, it's like 200 test cases or something that are testing very small things, but very specific things. So now if I know if I write a more complicated script and something breaks, I can then take that test case and strip it down and add it to my the rest of my test cases as well. And hopefully it will make my life easier in terms of trying to debug it and making sure that any fixes that I add as well won't result in like millions of other errors as well. But yeah, so so this is one of those projects where I think I for me having the real code is yeah very much half the battle but but it's also one of those things that i would have been fairly dogmatic about before but after working on a certain number of bigger projects i feel like there's a lot of advantages to being pragmatic about it as well so but that's just my opinion. So the tests are passing and I've got the different line lengths curtailed to the standard. So then I can start looking at the tests. And so I guess the test here will essentially be the same as the list collecting ones. So will I basically do the same? I guess speaking of real world code will will combine two of the features here as well in a test with a spread and a collection. And that should give the same result there. And then we'll also want our runtime errors. And we'll do one of those same calls, but with just one item. And that should give us an error too. So let's see where we are with the, okay, so I actually broke the project with my, my attempts to reduce the line sizes. So I'll do it like that. of functions that don't code gen correctly and are type checked wrong. Yeah, well, that's the, oh, that's very cool. That's something I really want to, to add at some stage. Now, I'm not sure how much 
effort I'm willing to put into having a language server, but I would really like that. That is, that's on the list of, of features I'd like to the language, definitely. And those tests that I've added seem to have passed as well, presumably. Yeah, params collect two to three. I think I just need to run it again with the new error test, but sometimes when <laughs> code passes first try, I'm like, really? Do I trust myself and <laughs> enough to, to think that it worked first try? But now, like the the functionality is so similar to the list implementation that I feel like there's less scope for errors, but still it's always something I'm a bit wary of. So param even especially the spread collect one, because that's kind of a a new thing for me. Uh in terms of language features, so. To just, out di just output diagnostics is not much effort with two crates. Okay, that could be cool. Yeah, I must check those out. In fact, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a quick screen grab of your suggestions there and I'll, I'll be referring back to those later. <laughs> Thanks. Language server is only 250 lines. That's very nice. Yeah, so maybe that's something. Like I have a bunch of features that I would like to, to do with this language, including have a Python style debugger where you can basically start the, the debugger from any point in the code as basically just putting the breakpoints manually and also having a Go style formatter and bits and pieces like that. So there are a couple of things I would like to do and language server is one of those definitely. Cool, that's nice. <laughs> Thanks for the suggestion. So now we're just sorting clippy issues. to split it up sometimes. So I'm actually just going to be bold and say that Clippy can relax a bit. Oh, you need to write it in TypeScript. Yeah, I, I thought TypeScript would be a thing that I'd enjoy a lot more, but for whatever reason, I actually find myself getting, I don't know, it, it's one of, one of the strange languages for me because in general when I'm writing when I'm programming I always like to have types my preference is usually typed by default but you know when I am writing often enough JavaScript and Python I'm thinking gosh I'd love to just be able to add some type annotations here and there and even just incrementally add types to the project. But for whatever reason, then when I'm actually using TypeScript, which does, I think, allow for incremental definition of types as well, I just don't have a good time. Like usually I'll, I'll ignore types until it's time to commit and then I'll go back and do the types. And it's such a, such a headache. And sometimes I end up having to rework the project a little to, to account for the types. So, but yeah. Small, small gripes, nothing major. So runtime errors, let's see, destruct spread. And that is line four. Expected at least two arguments, got one. Nice, and that's a fairly 
clear error in my opinion as well, so that's nice. Features, variables. Oh, for Vim, you don't need the client and TypeScript. And can you use the, oh, I see, I see. And can you use the language server with the newest Vim? Like last, like I really don't keep up to date with things at all, but last I heard is Vim 8 had support for async stuff. So you don't quite need to to move to NeoVim, which I like, I really like NeoVim as well, but sometimes it, it seemed to me that I might need to do a little bit of configuration with it and <laughs> I'm just far too lazy for that. So, uh, yeah, so, so yeah, I'm just using Vim at the moment. Okay, cool. And does Vim?
Cool, I think that's almost everything, I guess. That error is just from the name of the test. So let's go ahead and add the different bits. just finished its evaluation there so I can go ahead and push awesome and so that brings us nicely to just after two and a half hours so let's jump to the scratch file we've knocked off another feature and so we've only got objects left to do for the unspread operator then we can implement underscore for skipping variables in things like destructured assignments and then interpolated strings could have a little meat, bit of meat in it string escaping similar error handling wouldn't imagine that's too much work especially since i've done it before and this bit i think will be very straightforward i just basically need to to pick a syntax is <laughs> probably the the trickiest thing there so i think i'm at a point where i'm deciding between the arrow syntax or the double colon syntax. Mm, I think I'm slightly more in favor of the arrow syntax. Let me just do another, <laughs> every so often I'll look at the keyboard just to see are there any other symbols that I haven't really been making use of that I could use for this. Mm. Nothing's really jumping out. Pipe, maybe. Nah. Tilde. Mm. Ash symbol. Dollar. No, it's not quite doing it for me. I guess, yeah, I guess arrow symbol potentially. We'll see. We'll see how it ends up. Not, not a majorly impactful decision, at least in my mind. So that's basically it for today. So that was the implementation of the collect operator for both lists and function calls, which were effectively the same kind of implementation just a little bit different and that's all the tests updated and feature files updated too so no a nice chunk of the implementation up to date now today and so next day potentially working on object on the same operation but on objects cool so with that thanks to everyone for watching thanks to everyone for chatting in the comments, really engaging today. And that was a lot of fun. So thanks very much and see you again next time. Take care.